Hey, Larkin Rose here, and time for part two of the video series, The Island. Now, if you haven't seen part one, check the description below. I'll give the link to that, because that'll make more sense. Um, as a quick recap, the idea is to help you answer your own questions about the idea of a stateless society, a society without a ruling class, instead of me telling you how everything would work and how you should do things and how people will arrange things. Uh, it's basically a way to help you answer your own questions. Um, and I've done this in person a few times with some groups of people. It's been a while, but, but I find this to be a very useful little thought experiment. So in the first one, we talked about the idea of what if everybody's scary and, and dangerous and violent? What are we going to do about that? And then we had <laughs> Clear Horsey being a, a fish thief and then a murderer. And what do we do about it? And the, the punchline is basically, well, what would you do about it? What would you feel justified in doing? So one of the first concerns that people have is to, when they think about a, a society without a ruling class is, well, what about the scary people? Because... It's one of the things they expect government to do, despite the fact that A, government does a really bad job of protecting you from private thugs, and B, government absolutely always steals more than all the private thieves combined. Always. They call it taxation. Um, and so if you say we need the biggest thief in the world because without it, somebody might steal from us, kind of a weird argument. But one of the things that people aren't, aren't used to having normal people deal with is protection and defense. So they think about that. See, there's this pattern of whatever people aren't used to seeing done without a ruling class, they fall into this assumption that, well, if the group, if you have a ruler and his enforcers, you know, I don't care if it's one guy or Congress or whatever, and they're the ones who handle the roads or the military or police, the idea of, well, they're not going to be here anymore, to some people means, so nobody's going to defend us and nobody's going to protect us. And that's not at all what it means. But I sympathize a little bit because if you are if you lived your whole life and the group of parasites called government were the ones handling a certain thing, and I'm suggesting they shouldn't even exist, it's easy to, to, to you know follow that up with, well, well, then what about those things they used to handle? And so basically this is this whole exercise is you answering your own question is how will those things be handled without a ruling class? Now, so here we are on the island again without a ruling class. Here's you, here's me, in case it comes up again. So we talked about how do we dare deal with the scary people, but then there's the how do we do the positive things? How do we accomplish useful things? There are a lot of immediate knee-jerk responses people have to the idea of a stateless society that are, uh, sounds a little bit mean to say, logically ridiculous, but very common. And I'll explain the psychological reason for why that happens um, later on. But in this setting, in a hypothetical scenario, nobody would say that. So let's say, here we are, we just got shipwrecked on an island. Again, it's a group of people you mostly don't know. Um, you're there and I'm there. There's no 911, there's no authority. It's a bunch of people on an island. There's a bunch of natural resources, so we're not starving to death or dying of thirst or anything. But we have to like get along like grown-ups and figure out how we're doing things. There's no king, there's no master. If I were to say, I don't want there to be a master on a throne bossing us around, which I would say, would you respond by saying, oh, so you think it should be every man for himself? Is that a rational response to the idea of not having an authoritarian ruler that I must think it's every man for himself? No, it's completely ridiculous. It's a complete non sequitur. And yet a lot of people when they picture a society without a ruling class, they think, oh, so you want everyone to be self-sufficient and it's every man for himself and like survival of the fittest and suddenly like we're violent cavemen fighting each other. Why would you jump to that just as a result of the suggestion that we not give anyone permission to violently dominate us all? And in this setting, you wouldn't. If you had a little hypothetical setting of, you know, 30 some people on an island, and I said, um, we don't need a ruler who's going to boss us around and hurt us if we disobey. Nobody would respond to that by saying, oh, so you want us all to like scatter for the hills, every man for himself, everybody run off and do his own thing and nobody talk to each other. 
No, why on earth would it mean that? That's utterly ridiculous. And yet it's a very common response that a lot of people have because they think that organization and cooperation come from government. Despite the fact that, no, it doesn't. <laughs> the vast majority of useful organization and cooperation is already voluntary. And it already isn't coming from authoritarian coercion. It's coming from people deciding to work together. So because people don't have a whole lot of practice thinking in terms of, well, how do we be people without a ruling class? And they don't have a whole lot of practice of, in their brain of picturing that they start with this muddy, almost a blank slate of just, I have no idea what that would look like. And so they often say, how will this work? How will the roads work? How will, that? How will we take care of the poor? How will we do this? Are we just going to let the poor starve to death? That, that's another one. It's like, how does me saying, I don't want this guy and his thug bossing me around, somehow that equates to I want people to starve to death? Like, those are the options. <laughs> Why are those the options? That's really weird. Um, and... When people aren't used to thinking in those terms, they have to go through the process of exercising it themselves. So again, the point of these videos isn't for, for me to answer your questions about how things would work without a ruling class. It's basically for me to help you answer your own questions. Because again, I'm not going to be the new boss in charge of a stateless society. That's a contradiction. I'm going to be in charge of me. I can tell you what I would do. I can tell you what I would feel justified doing if there's a fish thief or whatever. I can't tell you what you would feel justified doing. I can't tell you what choices you should make. I can make suggestions just like anybody can. You might think my suggestions are smart or stupid or immoral or good or noble or whatever. And then you're going to decide for you what you think is right and what you're going to do. That's just the truism. And the belief in authority and government doesn't change that. You still decide what you're going to do. So what about the positive things? Not just, well, what do we do about a fish thief or a murderer? The things that like we should organize, like there, there are certain things we can each do on our own, but do we each want to be stuck having to be self-sufficient? Like every single person here has to grow his own shelter and get all his own food. And no, like specialization is really dang useful and perfectly legitimate and moral. And in fact, that is what allows for a level of prosperity. If every single person had to be able to do everything for himself from making his clothes to, to hunting, to building stuff, to everything else, and nobody's cooperating in any, any way, that would be a very primitive form of lifestyle. And it's also stupid and pointless and completely unnecessary, including without a ruling class. And so a lot of people, because they, they sort of think that government is the source of organization and cooperation, well, it's how society decides to... No, it isn't. Society doesn't decide anything. Individuals decide things. Now, a group of individuals can decide to do a certain thing, and they can even form hierarchy. So I'm going to give an example, because a lot of people, they, like, when I say that I advocate no ruling class, they'll say, well, it's natural for people to get together and, and cooperate and form groups. Y yeah. And at what point did I say, don't get together and form groups? I said, don't have a violent parasitic ruling class. But again, if people are used to the the organizers and planners being authoritarian psychos with a bunch of enforcers then they have a hard time imagining how that happens without it. So let me give you a very simple example. So here we are on the island. Let's say this guy is a plumber, or was a plumber before we got shipwrecked here. And he says, you know, most of us now have our huts down by the shore, and we all walk way up to the freshwater stream that comes down off the mountain. But that stream gets within like a quarter mile of us, and it happens to be that I found a whole bunch of bamboo growing all over the place on this island. Well, you can actually use bamboo as piping. And if we rig up a thing, and I can show you how to do it if people want to help me, I can make it so we have running water down by the huts. Just, you know, a little trickle that's constantly going that's coming down from the stream uphill so we don't all have to walk to the stream every time we want water. Now, if he says that, and here's you, 
is your response to say, okay, this guy gets to boss us all around and force us to go along with whatever plan he wants? I'm guessing no. <laughs> that would not be your response. Certainly wouldn't be my response. It's not going to be any of these people's response. It's not even going to be his response. The plumber isn't going to say, so therefore I get to force you all to go along with my plan, unless he's completely bonkers and a sociopath, in which case all the people are going to say, no, you don't. What the hell is wrong with you? However, what he can say and very well might say is, I figure if I can get, you know, 10 of you to help me out, probably in a day we could have running water down here, like constant little trickle coming out of a, a bamboo pipe. So who wants to help me? Now, this is forming a hierarchy, but it's completely voluntary. So let's say a bunch of people say, yeah, we'll help you out with that. That sounds cool because we're tired of having to wander away over there every time we want to drink a water. So we're going to help you. And maybe some other people are say, well, we're still working on our huts or we're exploring the island or we're trying to hunt for food or whatever. Like the other people are like, well, we're kind of busy. Now, this guy is in one sense in charge and this should be a very simple, obvious distinction, but because people don't usually think about these things, it might not be. He's only in charge of the people who, minute by minute, decided to let him be in charge of them in this particular way. The plumber, <laughs> their ex-plumber, isn't suddenly going to say, you must all serve me and bow down unto me. They'll just say, no, you're a psycho. <laughs> we'll do nothing of the sort. But if they go along with his plan because he happens to know better and know how to do something, then you get a voluntary hierarchy. Now, this brings up the thing that, that a lot of people say, well, so what if we do the water and fuzzy horse over here who didn't contribute anything, he didn't help. I mean, this is true of a bunch of them. Are we going to let him use the water? What happens if he uses the water and he didn't help make it? So maybe that's the, the freeloader problem, as it's known. Now, that can sort of be a concern with like, well, should we just have the water be for the people who help put this thing together or are we going to let everybody use it? You can think what you want about that. You can have an opinion. You can think, well, no, maybe we should make it and only the people who actually chipped in get to use water from that and we'll actually prevent other people from using it. Or maybe you think, well, they put it together, but who cares? It's just water coming out. It's coming out anyway. Like it's going to keep coming out. We might as well let everybody do it. Whatever your opinion of that particular, of the freeloader problem, in that <laughs> scenario, would you ever default to, that's why we got to get rid of him and put a ruler up and have him have enforcers and violently dominate everybody? No, I'm guessing you wouldn't do that. That would be utterly insane and completely irrelevant and do absolutely nothing to solve the problem anyway. So a lot of the questions and objections people have to the idea of a stateless society without a ruling class it isn't actually a rational objection. It's just they're not sure how it would work without a ruling class. So they default back to, so we better do it the way that I'm familiar with, which involves a gang of parasites robbing everybody and forcibly dominating everybody. Not because that's moral, not because it's efficient, not because it's product productive, not because it's legitimate, but just because it's familiar. But you can see that people make the flying leap. So I'm going to ask you, when you're pondering the, the freeloader problem, like Fuzzy Horse wants to use some of the water from the system that these guys, and where'd my plumber go, and the plumber put together, do you think that problem, the answer to that problem is, we need a violent ruler that controls everybody and taxes everybody? I don't. I'm over here saying no. But you tell me, do you think that would justify suddenly having a ruling class? And you may get another group where, you know, there's a, a, this is a bunch of random people who just got shipwrecked. So maybe, maybe, maybe this fuzzy pawn says, as it happens, oh, this isn't a throne. He's not a ruler. He's just him. Fuzzy pawn, not you, different fuzzy pawn. Fuzzy pawn says, as it happens, I used to teach a survival course where I teach people how to build shelters and make them rainproof and teach people how to, to build snares and how to hunt and how to you know, know what in the woods you can eat without dying and stuff. So I make the following offer that if anybody wants to um, sort of join my team, 
we can all build huts. And like, if I get six people to join my team, then we'll build seven huts and we'll each get a hut. But like me doing it myself uh, is, would be a nightmare and not work. But if we work together, I think pretty quickly we could get seven huts and then we'll each have a hut. So let's say a bunch of people say, yeah, we'll do that. We'll be on your team and we'll do that. Now, at this point, people have so little exercise at thinking in terms of concepts and principles that a lot of people say, well, that's government. No, it isn't. Because nothing is forcing these people to participate or to fund it or to obey anything. Nothing's forcing them to either. They just decided they would go along with it, like knowing that we'll, we'll do this work for you if we end up with a hut. In this case, it's bartering. We don't have currency yet in this hypothetical scenario. That doesn't magically equate to government. But a lot of people do this weird thing where they're assuming that, well, it's naturally going to form a government. At what point would this naturally form a government? You can have people organizing to, to bring in water or to build huts or to go on, you know, hunting expeditions, like as a group, if there's like wild boar on the island or something, whatever. And in no case does that suddenly jump over into, they have the right to rule me. So, well, I should put that as a question. If a bunch of people group together to say, we're going to see if we can go find some edible plants. And another group says, we're going to go see if we can hunt down a deer or a wild boar or something, see what's on the island to eat. Are you going to say, well, then you have the right to rule me. Would you? No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to answer for you. Unless you're completely loony, you're not going to jump to, well, that means you have the right to rule me. So they're not government, they're just people deciding to organize and cooperate to accomplish things. Now, it can get more and more complicated, and as you grow this and expand it to more and more people, and you can imagine adding more islands or adding thousands of people, at what point does the morality change? At what point are you, here's you, suddenly going to say, well, now we definitely need a violent ruler and his authoritarian thug making us all obey him. Is there some magic number where suddenly we need that? You can have very complex methods of organization and cooperation. Like maybe you're, they'll end up where every hut has running water inside it and a little drain that goes out and we build it all out of bamboo and stuff. We may have these like intricate shelters and tunnels and bow and arrows to go hunting with and we may like catch local ground fowl and domesticate them. And, you know, there's a million things that people can, can get together and, and decide to do without a ruling class. At what point are you, because this is you, going to suddenly say, we need to be violently dominated by somebody? Because that's what government is. It's not organization. It's not cooperation. It uses those things in addition to violent coercion, it's usually a very organized form of immoral extortion and <laughs> subjugation, but it's not the source of those things. And in this setting, everybody would understand it. And that's the weirdest thing. So I'm just going to, I'll make this part sort of short. There'll be at least one more part. But I want to leave you this question. If in this setting, if you give the example of somebody's being a fish thief or even a murderer, or somebody says, hey, I know how to make us have running water down at the beach if a bunch of people will help me. Or somebody says, I know how to build huts. If people want to like help me out, I'll show you how to do it. And we can like all, all group together to build you know seven huts. So all of us are building each of the huts. Then we each end up with our own hut. And people can decide to go along with that or not. And you can have hierarchies, voluntary hierarchies, groups of people who say, yeah, we'll follow your lead because we don't know what the hell we're doing. A lot of other people might say, no, we think we can build our own shelter, so we don't need that. And I'm guessing you're not going to say, no, he gets to force you to go by his plan. You would say, well, okay, you can build your own hut. <laughs> like, if that isn't your answer, then there's something wrong with you. But what I really want you to consider is if in this setting, this hypothetical scenario, whether you're talking about a fish thief or a murderer or trying to get running water down to where we live or doing organized hunts or raising fish or, you know, a zillion different things that we can organize. 
If at no point you would suddenly say, well, now we need to be violently dominated by a parasitic ruling class. If in, that, if in this setting you would just say, well, people should just organize and do it voluntarily and figure out how to cooperate. And if somebody doesn't want to help with some project, they don't help with the project. Nobody gets to force them and conscript them and enslave them just because my idea is really good, so I'm going to enslave all of you to go along with it. I'm assuming you'd be against that. So here's my question that I'm just going to leave you with <laughs> to finish this part of the video. If in this scenario, you always give the voluntarist anarchist answer. There's a bunch of different ones. There's a bunch of different suggestions or opinions how to deal with it. But if your answers always are about voluntary cooperation and organization in this setting, and you never in this setting get around to saying, this is why we need a violent dominator and his enforcers to make us all obey him, whatever his ideas might be. If you never do that in this setting, why would you do that in real life? Does changing the number of people at some point suddenly make morality change? Or the way human beings should behave, does it make that change? Suddenly, ah, oh, well, when you get to 7,427 people, suddenly it's good and righteous and legitimate and necessary to have a gang of violent parasites robbing everybody else. Is that how it works? Or is there something kind of telling about the fact that in a realistic, concrete scenario, your own personal opinions about how you should behave and how you would interact with other people is 100% voluntary, but out in your real life, you believe in politics. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican or Constitutionalist or any other flavor of wanting some form of government or another. If you would advocate that out in this world, out in the real world, which you do if you vote for anybody, then you're advocating violent coercion by way of a ruling class, whether you want to call it that or not. Why don't you advocate that in here? Why wouldn't you advocate that on the island? Now, part of the answer, I'll give you part of the answer, but not the most important part. Part of the answer is in this setting, the violence is too direct and obvious. If you say, I want this guy on the throne and this guy to enforce whatever he says, well, it's hard to hide that under euphemisms. The violent would be right in front of you and everybody else. You'd be saying, I want this guy beating you guys up if you don't do what he says. And when it comes to government, it's more like, well, I voted for the party that had candidates that endorse a policy that I think does a better job of helping the poor with blah, blah, a bunch of mushy BS where the violence is hidden under layers and layers of euphemism and and rhetoric and propaganda, here it would be obvious. Either you advocate peaceful coexistence or you advocate authoritarian domination. Either way, it's pretty clear which one you're gonna be advocating, so it's harder to hide it. But there is something more important. Why, in this setting, if you were actually on an island with a bunch of people, would you go for peaceful coexistence and want things to be done based on a voluntary uh, basis but in real life, you don't. You advocate government. Why the hypocrisy? Why the contradiction? Why wouldn't you want to be appointing a king over everybody to make sure they behave and make sure you're... Or would you? <laughs> I mean, you can say if you would, but so far I've never met anybody who does. By the way, I've done this with a number of groups um, in real life. It's been ages. I should do it again sometime. Um, and they were Democrats and Republicans, and I think some of them were already voluntarists and stuff. And they all, like, I would bring up a scenario like the fish thief or, or somebody even more dangerous, and they would all talk about, well, what should we do? Knowing that whatever they do, they're personally responsible for it, so it suddenly put them on the spot where they're like, well, what would I feel justified in doing myself? Because I can't say oh, I was just following orders. There's no, no one's giving orders. It's, people are just people. And we all recognize that whatever you choose to do, you chose to do, like I was talking about in the last video. And at the end of those sessions, I would ask people, okay, this didn't come up at all until now. How many of you can tell the political positions of other people in the room, like whether they were Republican or Democrat? We've been sitting here talking about how to deal with a bunch of these things. 
Sometimes they'd have a vague guess, but most of the time they had no idea. Because all of them, given the scenario like that, become voluntarists. Because that's what they really are. If you were actually of the mind that human beings cannot coexist without being violently dominated by a gang of parasites, you would advocate that in a group of 30-some, or 10, or a million, if that was the principle you believed in. So, I mostly said I'll let you think about this, but I'm giving you a bit of a hint. You don't really believe in statism if in this scenario you don't advocate statism. Now, I don't have any problem with such a contradiction because what I advocate for this is, hey, nobody attack anybody, please. No one commit aggression. You can organize in a zillion different ways based on voluntary cooperation. Some people can suggest some things and I'll join in. Yeah, I like your plumbing idea. I'll help out. And somebody else says, well, I want to make a bridge over the creek. And I'll say, well, I don't really care that much. I just wait across the creek. So I don't want to be part of that. And they might say, well, we're only going to let people use the bridge if they help build it. And I can say, okay, it's your bridge. I can walk across the creek somewhere else. I don't have to change my principles based on the scale. My principle is you own yourself. And that's true whether there's 30 other people here or 7 billion other people here. And the level of organization and cooperation and sophistication obviously gets way, 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 way more dramatic when you're talking about uh, huge civilizations with billions of people and, and lots of technology, not just 30 some strangers that were dumped on an island. But the moral principles are the same, which is why if you ask me a scenario in this group or in the group of people known as earthlings, <laughs> The principles stay the same. So I'm going to leave you this with this question. If your principles don't stay the same, if you give the anarchist or voluntarist answers in the setting of this hypothetical, you know, 30 some people shipwrecked on an island, and yet you give statist answers in real life, why?